This is Cambodia 1990. One year ago, in a film broadcast around the world, we showed that this uniquely tragic country was once more in danger of falling to the greatest mass murderers since Hitler, the Khmer Rouge of Pol Pot, and that Western governments and the United Nations were allowing this to happen for reasons of Cold War politics. The response from the public was unprecedented. Tens of thousands of people wrote to their governments seeking for Cambodia, not charity, but action. Unfortunately, this film is not a celebration of a Cambodia now freed from the threat of another Holocaust. It's about betrayal. A betrayal of those who asked for help for Cambodia, regardless of whether that help meant offending the United States and China, which give direct and indirect support to the Khmer Rouge. Above all, it's a betrayal of a people who have struggled virtually alone to rebuild their stricken country. For tonight's film will show that Western governments are among those secretly providing the means for Pol Pot's return to power. Lately, Cambodia has become a newspaper headline about peace talks that never bring peace. For those of you who have shown your concern about Cambodia, beware. Recent reports of peace agreements deceive and manipulate public opinion. There have been no agreements, only the imposition of the strategic aims of great powers upon a suffering nation. This has been done by coercion and bribery. What it solves is diplomatic embarrassment. What it threatens is a fragile normality that is the remarkable achievement of the Cambodian people. This is Phnom Penh. For more than a decade, the United Nations, led by the Western China, has isolated these resourceful and resilient people barring them from all international agreements on trade and communications, even from the World Health Organization. Instead, Pol Pot and his gang have been allowed to occupy Cambodia's seat at the United Nations behind the facade of a coalition invented by America and China, and all because the liberators of Cambodia, the Vietnamese, had the temerity not only to get rid of Pol Pot, but to turn back invasions by both America and China. This is the logic and spite of Cambodia's punishment. They have started from scratch. I would say worse than scratch. Without means, isolated, without anybody to, to come and see what was going on in this country, without strength, without human resources that have been uh, decimated. It's incredible the resilience of these people. And I, I really feel bad when I, I read uh, the press outside and the media, and uh, they speak like these people do not exist. Eh? Since the first American bomb fell on neutral Cambodia 21 years ago, the people here have been prey to those who call themselves peacemakers. The latest peace plan has been put forward by the United Nations. The permanent five members of the Security Council, which is dominated by the United States and its allies, demand the resignation of the Hun Sen government in Phnom Penh, even though this is Cambodia's only effective government, providing the only opposition to the return of Pol Pot. Under this UN plan, the Khmer Rouge will be given a share of power. If really the West or the free world or whoever want to help these people. If they are really sincere, then they should come here and see what these people see, and then try to strengthen their, their, their sense of, uh, first of all, their dignity, because they don't lose dignity, the Khmer. Huh? They die, but they don't lose their dignity. And then strengthen their sense of independence. They are looking in all ways to do that. Fear is like a presence here. The other day, 56 people were taken off two trains and shot dead by the Khmer Rouge, simply because they work for the government. 
Pol Pot's defense minister has boasted an enemies list of two million people. When the curfew comes, the night belongs to the prospect of a second holocaust. At the end of World War II, the Times correspondent, on arrival at the Nazi death camp at Belsen, wrote, It's my duty to describe something beyond the imagination of mankind. That was how I felt in 1979 when I reached Cambodia in the aftermath of Pol Pot's terror. Once again, it's necessary to come here and say that. Once again, it's necessary to guide the camera to these mass graves, which are everywhere in this country. Here murdered people were dumped, many of them children, headless and naked. Horrors that were photographed and documented by Pol Pot's Gestapo, known as S-21. In three and a half years, a fifth of the population were put to death. Not a single Western leader has come to the killing fields of Cambodia just to pay their respects, as almost all have done at Belsen and the shrines in Israel. In the past year, there have even been attempts to rewrite the evidence provided by those of us who saw and smelt and cannot forget these graves when they were discovered. The United Nations Security Council dropped the word genocide from its reference to the Pol Pot years so as not to offend China, Pol Pot's underwriter. American and other Western documents no longer refer to genocide and mass murder, preferring to describe the extermination of more than a million people as human rights abuses or merely the policies and practices of the recent past. The universally condemned policies and practices of a recent past, unquote, referred to in an earlier report, are in fact the policies and practices of the 1975 to 1978 period. While the West publicly tries to distance itself from Pol Pot, American officials in embassy background briefings describe the Khmer Rouge as different and changed out of all recognition. This insidious campaign has been echoed in the media. Pol Pot may have been brutal, but he was no mass murderer. He may have been a bit paranoid, but there was no genocide. This article has been widely distributed by Pol Pot's man in New York and by the Foreign Office in London. It says the West must stop moralizing about the Khmer Rouge and reach out to them. It complains that the genocide issue has been exploited to the full and says that Pol Pot's followers are now regarded as honest and are admired for their discipline and self-respect, qualities that most spheres of Cambodian society lack. This campaign of rehabilitation suppresses the fact that the Khmer Rouge are masters of coercion, intimidation and propaganda. We have evidence of Pol Pot's secret plans to fool Western governments and to take power as he did before. These notes are of secret speeches made by Pol Pot and discussions with his leadership. Pol Pot's spokesman, Q Sampan, who has smiled his way around the world at so-called peace conferences, made the following declaration to Khmer Rouge commanders. The outside world, he said, keeps demanding a political end to the war in Cambodia. I could end the war if I wanted, because the outside world is waiting for me. But I am buying time to give you comrades the opportunity to carry out all the military tasks. At this point, Pol Pot added that to end the war politically would make his movement fade away, and this must be prevented from happening. We shall push a liberal capitalist line, he said, but we are not changing our true nature. Following the showing of our film a year ago, Western governments appeared to listen to public opinion. Sweden changed its vote at the United Nations. Public opinion in Sweden and in other democratic countries has strongly voiced its revulsion at the prospect of the possible return of the Khmer Rouge. This is a healthy reaction which my government cannot and will not ignore. Australia launched its own peace plan. Britain sent diplomats to Cambodia for the first time in 15 years. However, at international conferences, a different game was being played, as one diplomat put it. 
ministers from Britain and other Western governments actually reinforce Cambodia's isolation by treating the Khmer Rouge not as international criminals, but to quote Mrs. Thatcher in an unguarded moment, as reasonable people who will have to play some part in a future Cambodian government. A term was invented to help cover Western deceit. The term is comprehensive settlement. It means that no settlement is acceptable to the West and China unless the Khmer Rouge are given a share of power in Cambodia before elections are held. This is the equivalent of inviting the Nazis to take part in the reunification of Germany. In other words, by allowing him to manipulate international diplomacy, the West has given Pol Pot a veto over peace in Cambodia, and as a result, he has come within an ace of achieving his aims. This is Kompong Spur province. One year ago, when we were here, the villages along this road were considered secure. Today, the Khmer Rouge are all around, and this is the front line less than 50 miles from the capital, Phnom Penh. The Khmer Rouge have captured several villages. They've separated men and women, held forced marriages, and enslaved able-bodied people. Those trying to escape have been shot. Anyone seriously injured from stepping on Khmer Rouge mines has been shot or simply left to die. As Western diplomacy has sought ways of accommodating the Khmer Rouge, their shadow grows longer here where there is no diplomacy. The situation is worse than it was a year ago. The Khmer Rouge are putting mines in paddy fields and the number of casualties is increasing every day. Every organisation working with people is worried stiff about the number of amputees, deaths and serious injury. Red Cross has estimated that there are at least 100,000 displaced people and the indications are that number will increase if the war goes on and the fear of Khmer Rouge remains. So the situation is deteriorating. And still, no large-scale aid is going from the West to assist the people of that country. In the last year, Cambodians have gained a new distinction. With the Lebanese, they are now the most disabled people in the world. From stepping on mines, there are now 80 new amputees every day. Can you tell me about this man, what happened to him? This man go to the field, not rice field, to the field for uh, do the, the field and yeah. plant the, some... Some wheat? The, some, some yes, wheat. yes. And in this moment, he catch the, the mine. Ah, the, ah. the mine. Like this. And it blew off his leg. Yeah. yeah. And he lost the, the leg. What will happen to him when he goes back to his village? He cannot uh, nourish the... He can, cannot feed his family. He feed his family. Yeah, he cannot yes. feed his family. Mm. He think uh, maybe mm. his wife. His wife will, and will uh, sometimes the son. Yeah. Yes. Did his family survive the Pol Pot years? Uh, yeah, he lost six yeah. family members yeah. during Pol Pot years. The great political changes in Europe are bad news for Cambodia. Until recently, the Soviet Union and its former allies in Eastern Europe helped to keep this country going. Ten years ago, it was the Soviet Union that saved much of Cambodia from starvation. Since then, the Russians have supplied up to 80% of vital materials, such as medical equipment and drugs. Now this aid is being withdrawn. In the New World Order, the Russians can no longer afford to help the enemies of their new friends. This uh, patient is wounded by explosion of my in the mission, in the battlefield. Yes, yeah, I battlefield. see. Yeah. 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 And how has that affected him? Uh, the, the brain. Uh, uh, the I see. So, yeah. will, yes. will he survive, do you think? You don't think so? Yeah. I see. Can, can know, uh, yeah. Could, could, we, could you tell me about... Uh, 
Perhaps this this lady here. This uh, woman uh, is uh, wounded by Sujong Mai from uh, when she go to the the field yes. this year. Ah, uh, taga. Rice field. Yes. Rice field. Yes. Yeah. Mm. And this and this is her this is her infant here on the bed. Con cuore. Yes. Yeah. Her son. Her son. Yeah. How old is she? She's 23 years old. Minister, the arms that you are facing on the battlefield from the Khmer Rouge and their allies, what countries are supplying them? But the weapons used against us by the Khmer Rouge have brand names and trademarks which show that they come from Western countries, including France, Sweden and West Germany. We understood that most of the arms come from China but this is not the impression that we're getting here today. That's right. The guerrillas aren't only using Chinese weapons, they're also getting weapons from Western countries. Are you certain then that weapons being supplied from Western sources to the so-called non-communist resistance either get to or directly assist the Khmer Rouge on the battlefield. It is very obvious in the battlefield that all three factions, including the Khmer Rouge, are using the same weapons. All these weapons came from Western countries who supply arms to the KPNLF and the Khmer Rouge. Of course, we captured many weapons like these on the battlefield, but we have only brought some of them here to Phnom Penh to show people. The rest we use to defend ourselves. And they're very sophisticated weapons too. There's the German anti-tank weapon, a Swedish anti-tank weapon, and these are French. The discovery of these arms, which include American weapons, set us off on a journey around the world, revealing direct American and British involvement in the return of Pol Pot. Of all the mysteries surrounding support for Pol Pot, two questions are outstanding. How and why Western arms are getting to the Khmer Rouge? The evidence we have tells us to begin in Europe, here in Bonn, capital of Germany. What is the German connection with Cambodia? The West German government is still supporting the Khmer Rouge, or the coalition government. Uh, it's a totally immoral uh, a position, but the government can afford it because people don't know nothing about Cambodia and West Germany. And mm. uh, there's the political support, and then the more vital and more effective German support for the Khmer Rouge is a weapon called Armbrust, which is an anti-tank missile. It's a very effective weapon of the Khmer Rouge, and the Khmer Rouge use it against the tanks of the government forces and I found a Khmer Rouge who was really proud of this weapon who was yeah giving me my congratulations as a West German for this great weapon <laughs> so. hello is that Mr. Palinka? yes speaking I called the German arms manufacturer MBB to ask how their weapons got to Cambodia just to say that I'm returned from Cambodia recently uh, with new information which I would like to pass along to you and also to say that I'm recording this conversation for, for
for accuracy. Right. We came upon in Cambodia uh, armbrust weapons, uh, and I have a serial number which I'd like to give to you, and perhaps you could help us with the origin of this particular weapon. Okay. The full inscription is Lot Arm A, 840406 well, we, we can't comment on the serial number because it's not our serial number. This had come about, the company spokesman revealed, because MBB had sold the license to make the weapon to a Belgian company called PRB, whose headquarters are in Brussels. PRB, like many in the arms business, has a secret life. It's owned by Astra, the huge British arms and fireworks company based in Ramsgate in Kent. The company is currently under investigation for contractual irregularities, fraud in other words. It also made part of the supergun that ended up in Iraq. This much is public knowledge. What is not known is PRB's links to Pol Pot. In 1981-82, the company arranged for Chartered Industries of Singapore to produce the German armbrust weapon. We asked PRB to comment. Not only did they deny all knowledge of this weapon, they denied having anything to do with weapons at all. It is notoire that the firme PRB, Poudrerie Réunie de Belgique, has various activities. There are, in fact, several departments au sein de PRB in matière de fabrication d'armes and de fabrication de munitions. When we look at the report of the commission d'enquête, Euh, de la Chambre des représentants de Belgique sur les livraisons d'armes et de munitions, on peut voir pratiquement à toutes les pages citer PRB, PRB, PRB. Manifestement, cette société est impliquée dans une série de contrats importants vers l'Asie du Sud-Est. This most important contract led us to Singapore. Once the last bastion of the British Empire, Singapore is now a supermarket with banks, docks and a widely promoted image as a tourist centre. Run by the autocrat Lee Kuan Yew, Singapore is both America's and China's most active ally in Southeast Asia. For the past 11 years at the United Nations, Singapore has been the stalking horse of the trinity of Pol Pot, Washington and Peking. Here at last year's UN vote on Cambodia, the Singapore representative leads delegates who voted for the Khmer Rouge-dominated coalition to meet Pol Pot's man at the United Nations, himself complicit in mass murder. Prime Minister Lee has said the Khmer Rouge must be part of a settlement. Journalists, he said, have made them into demons. The image that is certainly not promoted here is that of Singapore, arms capital of Asia, occupying an entire city block all along here is the heavily guarded compound of chartered industries. It's here that Western arms are made under license and shipped straight to the Cambodian guerrillas. We asked chartered industries for an interview, but like everyone in this business, they suffer from acute shyness. This is hardly surprising, as chartered industries is owned by the Singapore government. This means that Singapore is a prime mover in the flow of arms that end up with the Khmer Rouge and it means that the Bush administration can continue its secret aid through Singapore, aid that breaks a law passed by Congress only last year. With Washington's backing, Singapore supplies the Cambodian guerrillas not only with German weapons, but also with this Swedish anti-tank weapon. We filmed these weapons soon after they'd been captured from Pol Pot's army. From Singapore, they are shipped here to the port of Satahip in Thailand. Thailand is critical to peace in Cambodia. Prime Minister Chattachai has made peace moves towards Phnom Penh and indicated he wants the Khmer Rouge out of their bases in Thailand. This has so alarmed the Bush administration that Washington has threatened to cut off trade privileges to Thailand. Chrysak Chunovan is a senior government advisor. I asked him why Thailand still allowed arms to reach the Khmer Rouge. 
to close the door completely on shipment of arms or whatever that, that you, you say is flowing through Thailand, um, it's also a very difficult uh, situation without a, a, a settlement. Those arms are coming from a variety of sources, aren't they? Yes. Not only from China, they're coming through Singapore, indirectly from Western governments. Yes, I even. believe so, yes. Would you like those Western governments that are indirectly helping the supply of arms to stop that? Yes, yes. I mean, I can go on record of asking for all Western powers in China to, to stop, you know, uh, arming the... Uh, fighting forces. And this is where the weapons arrive, a Khmer Rouge munitions warehouse in Thailand, filmed for the first time from inside the compound. But who owns this place? We had land registry records searched and found the identity of the owner classified. However, our sources tell us that the land is owned by the United Nations Border Relief Operation and leased to the United States government. This is ironic a humanitarian agency renting its property to a foreign government which allows the Khmer Rouge to use it as a military base. Near here is Zone 87, where Pol Pot lives and plans his reconquest of Cambodia. This rare map was originally drawn by American researcher Roger Normand. Zone 87 is an enclave inside Thailand's Trap province in which several times a year the leadership, the high leadership of the Khmer Rouge holds training sessions for high-level military cadre. The Khmer Rouge place a very high premium on indoctrinating their troops. There are 13-day sessions which are led by Pol Pot and some other top Khmer Rouge leadership, which includes Son Sein, who is currently the Minister of Defense for the Khmer Rouge, Kyu Sampan, who is the Vice President, and also Tamok and Yang Seri. It's the exact same leadership that controlled from 75 to 78 that is now controlling these training sessions and more than that from this space Pol Pot is really directing the political and military strategy of the KR. Pol Pot and his leadership are clearly important to the survival of the Khmer Rouge. Why don't you boot them out of Thailand? There's a few refugee um, camps that are in Thailand that are controlled by the Khmer Rouge. Mm. We are also afraid that if we do anything drastic to these uh, civilians under their control, they will be pushed and dragged inside Cambodia altogether, and they will suffer uh, a lot more. There was one uh, incident that the UN bro, the United Nations organizations who was running the camp there, that they wanted to move some of the uh, refugees to another camp, but the Khmer Rouge didn't allow it, and they, they prevented it with their weapons that the families who wanted to, uh, to go to a civilian camp, uh, they couldn't go because they had to go to a military camp. In these camps, the people are used by the guerrilla groups, both as hostages and a human shield, the camps are overseen by a clandestine Thai army unit called Task Force 838, which is funded and armed largely by the United States. Nearby is another arms supply warehouse. At this warehouse, sources have told me who, who are very acquainted with the warehouse, that an American comes into the warehouse every few weeks and asks, is there anything that is needed? and that includes military equipment. Requests are then put in, and the military equipment arrives. I doubt that it comes directly from the United States. It's much more likely that that would then come from Singapore. But I, I find it highly unlikely that Singapore is by itself paying for the arms that would end up to the, the KPNLF, and it's more likely that it comes from a deeper pocket like the United States. If our assistance, our overt and our covert assistance, is successful, it will have the direct result of returning the Khmer Rouge to power. That's the end result of any kind of military successes of the people we're supporting. It's the only time I can think of in history where we would desperately not want um, the military success of the people whom we are supporting. And I think we're playing a, a very, very dangerous game um, with you know, with our policy, and the United States policy is, is just simply an obscenity.
then why, with the Khmer Rouge within striking distance of Phnom Penh, is this policy, which you describe as an obscenity, still being pursued here in Washington? Well, I think it's because there's a small group of people at, at the top in the State Department and the National Security Council who are still fighting the Vietnam War. This is the State Department in Washington. Last July, Secretary of State James Baker said that America had changed its policy towards Cambodia, but he gave few details. I went to try and find out exactly what America's policy was. Sorry? No, I haven't been pre-cleared, no? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, what we need to ask you to do is not to film in here until we get a reading on it. First of all, we know, don't permit any filming inside the is State that, Department. Is that, is that a, that a it's, rule? It's, yes. Is it? Is, yes, that a, it's is it a written rule? Or? Uh, yes, it is. No um, film. Is the camera on? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it's on. I'd like to see Mary Carlin Yates, who's the head of the uh, Public Affairs Department, please. Hello. Yes. I'm John Cutaway, Mary Yates Secretary. Good, yes. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to contact uh, uh, an official of the Press Department, mm -hmm. the State Department, for more than a year to get a, pol uh, a statement of American policy on Cambodia. Okay. And that's why I've had to come here today to, uh, to, to deliver this letter. We believe there are urgent questions that should be answered. That's the letter. I'll give this to her and have her get back with you. Thank you very much. For more than a year now, we've been asking the State Department to speak about Cambodia, simply to state American policy. Each time we've been refused or fobbed off. I've never known such reticence in Washington on any issue. We've now learned that last April a policy decision was taken to keep the whole question of Cambodia's future and of American support for the Khmer Rouge off television. The administration media policy has, is very clear that they feel they can take all of the editorials against their policy in every newspaper in the country and that those are just glancing blows, but they need to stay off of television. And they have done everything they possibly could time and time again. They've made commitments to do TV interviews on, on national networks and then reneged on their commitments and then tried to bring people at as low down uh, a position in the bureaucracy to, to be the on-camera spokespeople. This is a policy that dares not speak its name. This is a policy which cannot stand the light of public scrutiny. Mm -hmm. This is a policy which is a cancer on the body politic of America. But what are the roots of current American policy in Cambodia? After Pol Pot had taken over in Cambodia in 1975, his army attacked Vietnam, killing thousands of villagers, as this rare film shows. In 1978, the Vietnamese overthrew the genocidal regime in Phnom Penh. Almost immediately, the United States began to give secret aid to Pol Pot. Washington was then courting the Chinese, who were Vietnam's ancient enemies and Pol Pot's main backers. The American aid to Pol Pot was critical in restoring the Khmer Rouge as a military force, now operating from Thailand. The extent of American support was revealed in this correspondence from congressional lawyer Jonathan Weiner. When this letter was circulated, the Reagan administration was furious. Then, without explaining why, the author repudiated the information, although it had come from the Congressional Research Service. However, the information in this second letter was, he told me, absolutely correct. It amounted to the same conclusion. Here was clear evidence that Pol Pot's secret backer was Washington. As a cover for its secret war against Cambodia, Washington set up the Kampuchea Emergency Group in Thailand. Known as KEG, it ensured that Western supplies were delivered to Khmer Rouge camps. In 1980, Bowing to U.S. pressure, the World Food Program handed over $12 million worth of food to the Thai army to pass on to the Khmer Rouge. In November of that year, Dr. Ray Klein, a former deputy director of the CIA and close advisor to Ronald Reagan, made a secret visit to a Khmer Rouge base camp inside Cambodia. Within a year, 
50 CIA agents were running America's Cambodia operation from Thailand. KEG was now known as the Working Group. Its job is to provide battle plans, war material, and satellite intelligence to the so-called non-communist resistance, most of it paid for by Washington. Today, American policy continues unchanged behind the front of United Nations involvement, which may well have the final effect of turning Cambodia into another Lebanon. Cambodia is the only country in the world to be denied United Nations development aid, and America, with China, has led this embargo. Without development aid, Cambodia will never, for example, have uncontaminated water. And children such as these will continue to die from preventable diseases. Hang, it's exactly one year since we were here and walked down this corridor of these children, and nothing appears to have changed at all. The patient is it. The capacity of this hospital, you know, that's why they still stay in the corridor. See, this little child's exactly the same as a child lying there a year ago, who I doubt uh, would have survived. Can you ask the mother what she's suffering from? Well, me, because you not This child is suffering from diarrhea and fever. Mm. Nothing has changed in one year. have children who are suffering and embargo means denying them the basic needs that could help these children recover so quickly. Those who sit in the United Nations in great comfort ought to be confronted by scenes like this, to actually stand next to a child in such need. What they did in the United Nations, you know, is really unfair because they vote against Cambodia and let children die because of diarrhea. Last year, the United States stopped the United Nations Development Aid Mission from going to Cambodia. Pol Pot has described American policy as very correct. American officials have constantly denied that they give any aid to Pol Pot. But U.S. Army weapons are reaching the Khmer Rouge via their allies. And we have evidence of direct American and British assistance to Pol Pot. From New Zealand, Sue Elliott, a senior official working with Cambodian refugees, talked to me on behalf of a former Cambodian guerrilla who, fearing for his life, must remain anonymous. Sue, could you tell me a little about... Uh your source and uh, also about yourself. I work with refugees and have done so for some 12 years and I have just returned from a study tour which took me to the United States, Britain and Thailand. The source is somebody I know and trust well who told me this information because they want the world to know and I myself uh, want to hand it on for humanitarian reasons. Having worked with refugees for a long time, I find it hypocritical to be working in an area where governments at one hand are supporting the continuation of fighting and on the other are giving people refuge from it. Could you tell me what your source told you as far as his training outside Cambodia was concerned? How did he get there and what happened when he got there? His training was in Malaysia. And there was one third of the group from the Sihanouk faction, one third from the Khmer Rouge, and one third from the KPNLE. What was the nationality of the principal advisors at the camp? They were American and British. Can you tell me what he told you about the training itself? What were the particular military skills that were passed on to them uh, by the uh, British and American advisors? The training consisted of military strategy, guerrilla warfare tactics, mine laying and weapon handling. They, they, mine laying was one of the uh, particular skills they were taught, is that correct? Yes. Mm. 
Britain's involvement was vividly demonstrated in September last year during the Vietnamese withdrawal from Cambodia. In Phnom Penh were MPs Anne Cluard and Jim Lester as parliamentary observers. But there were two other mysterious British representatives. I was introduced to them uh, and uh, I had some conversation with one of them initially and then the second one. And uh, I asked them what they were doing there. So I was rather curious because clearly they weren't official uh, delegates from the United Kingdom. And uh, they told me that they were there on holiday. But on the official list of observers, they are named as Anthony Norman and Christopher Mackenzie, representing Great Britain from the Ministry of Defence. Now, when you got back to London, did you make inquiries about these two men? Yes, because obviously I was very curious about them. So I went to the House of Commons Library and asked them to ring the Royal United Services Institute, which was apparently where these men worked, uh, and is based in Whitehall, and make inquiries, first of all, to establish that they did work there, and secondly, to ask what their jobs were. And back came the answer, um, who wants to know? And then the House of Commons Library told me what, when they told uh, the people the other end who wanted to know, uh, the response was, the information is classified. This is Mackenzie, whom we know to have been a member of Britain's highly secretive SAS. At the time of his visit to Cambodia, Mackenzie was a member of the SAS R Squadron, which officially doesn't exist, and therefore its activities can be officially denied. This is the other mysterious Briton, Captain Anthony de Norman, known by his friends as the Monster. De Norman has a long history in the SAS, at the end of last year, covering as a freelance photographer, de Norman returned to the Thai-Cambodian border. Members of our squadron often pass themselves off as photographers or tourists. Time after time we've been told in the House of Commons that there is no military involvement inside Cambodia. Minister after minister has stood at the box and repeatedly given us those assurances. Indeed, Mr. Waldegrave himself, not long ago, repeated this assurance. Concerned people in Britain have received a copy of a parliamentary statement by the Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd. It read, We have never given, and will never give, support of any kind to the Khmer Rouge. This was echoed in a letter from the Prime Minister to the Leader of the Opposition. But these statements were false. Foreign Office Minister Timothy Sainsbury later wrote that Britain does not give military aid in any form to the Cambodian factions. But this, too, is false. The SAS has given secret training to the Cambodian guerrillas for five years, and as we can now reveal, British support for Pol Pot has never been more crucial. It began around 1985 with um, at first one training team going out from the SAS regiment in Hereford to the Thai-Cambodian border to begin what became a series of training um, courses, seminars, for both the Sihanoukists and the Khmer Rouge. So the British knew they were teaching the Khmer Rouge? Yes, quite, mm. quite, quite definitely so. These were active service SAS personnel? Up until October 1989, when the whole question of the SAS role in training the Khmer Rouge became public, mm. and the stink that, that resulted in the, in the commons. Yes, these were serving um, SAS troops. What is the nature of British assistance to the Khmer Rouge now? Well, my understanding is that following the row that erupted last autumn mm. as a result of partly your programme and partly because my own newspaper, the government put the word out that support from that date onwards was to be very much more covert in its nature. So it has passed very clearly um, to be being an MI6 operation. The result of that has been that there are a number of former SAS people who are now out of the service and who are private individuals, mm. but that are working to some form of contract to provide training and mines technology to the Khmer Rouge. What exactly do you mean by mines technology? 
One can lay anti-personnel and off-route mines which can be detonated automatically by the sound of people moving along the track. There are an increasing number of anti-personnel mines which fire thousands of pellets into the air and once they embed themselves in people's bodies are incredibly difficult to find for doctors working with fairly rudimentary field equipment. And so these are the kinds of mines that are being supplied by the British? My understanding is that the British are still involved in supplying those sorts of mines, yes. Are they British-made mines? The mines themselves need not necessarily be British because there are a series of licensing agreements that obviously exist mm. worldwide, bringing with it the element of deniability. Yes. We're not laying mines with Made in UK on them. Like the US State Department, the Foreign Office in London has shown a marked reluctance to talk about Cambodia. For more than two months, we sought answers to questions raised in this investigation, but without success. We asked for an interview with Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd, but this has been repeatedly refused. Last year, Bill Yates asked people watching your program to pick up their pens and write expressing their concern to ministers and members of parliament of all persuasions. All those people not only have a duty, but in my view have a right to write again to those with political responsibilities saying, look, we gave our money, we provided our support. The solutions can only be found by governments providing aid on a scale that's necessary and by governments taking the political action that's necessary, stopping the arms supplies, stopping the fighting, people seeing the Pol Pot nightmare for what it was cannot imagine how that could be allowed to recur. And what we see now on the ground, those of us who are working with the people in humanitarian programs, is Pol Pot gaining ground again, poised, ready to take over the reins of power once more. Now, if that were to happen, how could any of us live with ourselves into the future? In the West, we are told that the Cold War is over, but this is not so. The Cold War was never just about attrition between the two superpowers. It was fought mostly with the blood of faraway people considered expendable in poor countries like El Salvador and Panama, Vietnam and Cambodia. It's surely the cruelest irony of 1990 that as the Berlin Wall is torn down, the Western democracies have rebuilt its equivalent around a nation of people who threaten no one and with whom none of us have any quarrel. Indeed, the extraordinary efforts of the Cambodian people to recover from their nightmare of bombs and genocide ought to be the object of our lasting admiration. At the very least, the willingness of our representatives to help them, not hurt them. The Khmer Rouge must be stopped. They must be brought to trial at the International Court of Justice and expel from the United Nations. All aid and comfort to Pol Pot and his allies, guns, mines, bombs, uniforms, training, food, and so-called diplomacy must stop. And their bases in Thailand closed down. And the wall built around Cambodia must be torn down, and aid to rebuild this country denied no more. Every day these steps are not taken, Every day that governments appease and deceive is a day lost for the people of Cambodia.